today on the Perception in Action podcast. A review of a new study comparing traditional prescriptive coaching, the CLA, and differential learning training for reducing ACL injury risk in basketball. Is variability an injury prevention mechanism? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Now on to the show. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. Today I want to look at another paper that has addressed kind of the relationship between the ecological approach and injury risk. And this is by Arangi and colleagues who's done, who he, the lead author here has done two previous studies on this on soccer, showing that you know, methods that promote variability and degeneracy, more movement, more options for moving, uh, serve to reduce the the risk markers for ACL injury, as I mentioned that in soccer. So the basic idea, right? ACL injury is a huge problem in sports. It affects more than two million dollars, two million athletes annually. Um, some of the risk factors can be identified in terms of how um, you your kinematics and kinetics of certain maneuvers, like change of direction movers. Um, so small flexion angles during the plant step um, limits the absor- absorption of forces, um, f- a flexion and range of motion in the hump, a trunk, things like that. So basically, there's we can identify what uh, is likely to predict an ACL injury. Of course, nothing's perfect, right? Um, these are risks. So cutting with a low flexion is a risk factor for ACL injury, Okay. Um, also, a valgus kind of rotational movement of the knee should be reduced, right? So that's another risk factor. And the important outcome from the previous studies and, and a lot of work is that enabling the movement to be formed more flexibly would help ACL in, in, injury risk. Performing something in exactly the same way, right, increases the chance of injury, right? You're putting stress on the same joints, right? So allowing for movement degeneracy, allowing for different options to solve the same task, which is what we try to achieve in ecological dynamics, of course, is going to prevent injury, right? And this um, goes with uh, with I don't this goes within the the um, injury uh, injury variability the variability hypothesis for reduction of injury, right? That variability is another kind of a mechanism involved in along with load and frequency. The other factor is variability. Doing the th- how much different options are you giving the athlete to perform this? Right, so we can promote variability, obviously, with using nonlinear pedagogy or constraints-led approach and differential learning. Um, so, lo- search, allowing the learner to search for multiple individual solutions, or, or f- almost for- forcing them to by get, making them do something different in every different in each attempt, are ways that we can promote this flexibility in the solution that reduces the chance of uh, repetitive injuries. Um, in their previous study, if you recall, they found that both nonlinear pedagogy, CLA, and what I'm going to call CLA from now on, and differential learning were superior to traditional prescriptive coaching for soccer, right? Um, they both resulted in reduction of forces and better kinematics, better, right? Um, better flexion, for example. Um, they, they found some evidence that the constraints that approach was superior to differential learning in this regard, but the results were not super strong. So what they wanted to do in this present study was kind of three things. One, they're going to try a different sport. They're going to do basketball instead of soccer. Two, they're going to do a longer intervention period. Maybe the results, we didn't give enough time. You know, ecological approach takes time. Maybe instead of um, 60 sessions, um, uh, instead of 24 in the previous studies, right? And they're going to measure a cutting task a little bit different than a complete change of direction task. Uh, the final thing they're going to look at, they're going to deliberately manipulate gender as a factor. So they're going to recruit equal number of males and females to see if the results are any different for males and females. You know, particularly ACL injuries are a big problem with female athletes. So they wanted to kind of separate that out. Right? So they have 60 participants, 30 females and 30 males. Uh, they're professional basketball players. 
um, university basketball team, uh, who are members of the university basketball team. Um, they were randomly signed to one of the training groups um, with equal gender, right? So they one male, one female. So it wasn't perfect random assignment, right? It was maintaining gender balance across the groups, okay? So the pre and post test, the participants had to do a change of direction test. So if you recall, the, the other one, they did a complete 90 degree one. So they ran and had to completely change direction. Here, they're doing a 45 degree cut. So they're running towards the screen. They're doing a 45 degree cut. One of the things that's kind of interesting in this is they have an arrow will appear. So they have uh, sensors that know when the person gets there. When they get close to the screen, an arrow appears. The direction and the color of arrow tells the athlete which way to cut, right? So might be a little bit um, different than the previous one is they don't know which way they're going to have to go. Obviously, they knew in the free that they're going back in the same direction. This one, they don't know if they're going to do left or right. So that's kind of an interesting twist as well. Uh, motion and forces were tracked with Viacon and force plates. Right? So kind of standard design. The training lasted five months. Each group three, three and one and a half hour training sessions per week. Um, the warm up practice, right? So just like with the previous study, right? The key point here is they're not practicing the cutting maneuver, right? They're not just focusing on the actual measure. They're just practicing basketball, right? Or in the previous one, it was soccer. So they're practicing shooting, dribbling, receiving, running, changing path without, so they have some things that are focusing on changing direction, um, changing path with and without the ball to get, you know, cutting to get open, right? But the, the main point here is they're not just focused on making you change direction better. They're just training you in the sport like we would normally, right? Um, the linear pedagogy or the traditional method, the instructor described, explained, and demonstrated the skill, whether it's passing, shooting, cutting, whatever. Then the participant practiced it. Um, we're looking for an ideal movement pattern by identifying errors and deviations and having giving corrective feedback. Um, changes were based on the average for the group, right? So we kind of changed as we went. So kind of very traditional coaching. Nonlinear pedagogy or constraints-led approach, no prescriptions for, uh, we're not focusing on an ideal movement. We're practicing the goal for each skill and we're manipulating constraints. So in the dribble to the side, um, for example, we could place an obstacle on the track and force the person to move left or right, right? To go around, add obstacles on the court, um, dribble to the opposite side, carrying boundaries, right? Um, leaving it up to the person to get around these obstacles and things like that. So we're adding constraints in terms of space, obstacles, things like that, that they have to move around while they're practicing. And finally, differential learning. Um, the differential was, was prescribed by each structure, right? Different body positions, different starting positions. Um, for example, dribble with eyes closed, dribble with when only one hand was used, dribble and pass. Um, so we're, what, we're, what we're going here is never, ever repeating the, the same uh, move, move in the same, same movement in the same, exactly the same way. So we're doing these kind of things. So in the paper, I think there's supplementary materials to the paper that show you ex more exactly what they did in terms of, but those are the three basic groups. Very similar to the soccer study, just longer and obviously a different sport. Okay. So what did they find? So what they found was they looked at the effect of training on these different angles, the flexion angle and the forces, right? So here we have the values at pre-intervention. If we look at the trunk flexion angle, which right low trunk flexion angle is a predict is a um, marker for ACL injury, right? Is a predictor. So you have 10, 11, 10 before intervention, all the same. Uh, after intervention, 13, 18, 16, right? So you can see they've gone up quite a bit for constraints-led approach, uh, not so much for linear, a little bit for differential learning. So what we can see, so they kind of mirrored their, their results from their first studies, um, just stronger and, and bit more statistical power to kind of separate them. Nonlinear pedagogy was better than traditional in terms of reducing markers for um, ACL injury, and it was also better than differential learning. But differential learning was also was better than still better than traditional, right? Promoting variability. Um, so uh, constraints that approach was better than traditional. Differential learning was better traditional, and constraints that approach was better for differential learning for all angles except one. Okay, there was a significant effect. So basically constraints-led approach was better in this study than differential learning, okay? 
So the sum, the results show that nonlinear pedagogy is most suitable motor learning petting, uh, motor learning method for achieving a safer execution of a cut, cutting maneuver, right? Larger knee flexion angles, uh, less forces, uh, increasing, um, so bending more to help attenuate the force, right? Critically, right, they never actually practiced this. No one told them that you have to bend more. They just created constraints and kind of pushed them to, in this direction. Um, they found no different. The, the, the methods worked equally well for both males and females, right? So there was no gender difference at all. Um, so we're tr not trying to. So we're not trying to minimize deviations from some ideal movement by diminishing movement variability in practice. We're trying to encourage practice variability, allowing the person to come up with their own solutions, uh, puts them in an environment that encourages them to explore and solve different movement solutions. Um, this can, there's two ways that this could help, right? That exploration could help. One, it could lead to generosity, giving you more, solving the same movement problem, like cutting in different ways. Or also, and or, it allows you to find solutions that are optimized for you. Fit your, fit your own individual constraints and intrinsic dy dynamics. Um, so we're you know we're we're seeing new solutions that effectively reduce the risk of ACL injury, right? Um, so the um, the discrepancy per previous study um, was the, you know so the, what they for, compared to their previous study that greater length of in in uh, intervention. Um, there's kind of a this argument here that practice variability might be more effective after initial coordination solutions are found and learn transition from freezing to freezing, free, freeing stages of learning, right? So with a shorter study, maybe the person's not able to take advantage of the constraints and the variability to come develop degeneracy because they're freezing, okay? Guided exploration may be more effective than a fully random or noisy search, i.e. differential learning of possible movement solutions, right? So the CLA approach seems to be better for reducing uh, injury risk, at least in their study, right? That as opposed to completely randomly doing different movements, which is what is promoted in differential learning, of course. Of course, and then this fits right within what I've talked about before, Vari movement variability is an injury prevention mechanism, right? It goes with the variability overuse injury hypothesis proposed by James, the idea that there's three things that determine injury, how, how hard you do something, how often you do it, and how consistently you do it. Where inconsistency is a good thing, right? It, it helps prevent reduced load, allows stresses to go on different joints, and things like that, right? So I think this, again, a nice additional study giving more, a lot of kind of replicating effect in a different sport, of course, but um, giving strong evidence for, for the Another benefit of using an ecological approach that allows for exploration is this injury prevention. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaches meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone through San Luis.